which is really where the business agility term in my mind comes in. There's a lot of definitions out there, but I've really abstracted it down to kind of this one simple sentence and one simple definition to really get my point across is that business agility is really the ability to survive in these times, right? It's the ability to create a resilient and dynamic system of empowered knowledge workers that adapt quickly to market changing market demands, innovate and create value for your customers. Um, and what I'll highlight there is uh, the word resilient, right? We talked about companies being fragile, right? And when they're being pushed upon, they're breaking, right? So that's that resiliency, um, something that we're seeing right now during the pandemic, okay? Right? When people are forced to work remotely, what's the resilience of the organization to be able to operate business as usual? The other piece of that is the a dynamic, that dynamic system. So we're talking about the ability to change holistically as a whole organization. Um, and, and so we're talking about probably the most difficult type of change, which is systemic change. And that's really where the value is. Um, for organizations now as they strive for this to be more um, agile as an organization. And this is very, very real, right? And there's no better time to really look in the mirror and reflect upon your agility um, because the pandemic has, is a true burning platform, right? It is organizations are now have, have to change. Um, they have to change the way they work. They have to change the way they collaborate. They need to change the way they are operating today, right? Um, and that's just the operational side. There's also strategic side. You know, how are their products doing? Um, are they recreating themselves? Is there a need to recreate themselves? Is there that innovative thinking that's really in, in, within their DNA? It's going to allow them to survive this this tough time um, because something like this tends to happen every 10 years or so probably not as in this magnitude but you think about 9-11 you think about um, the financial crisis of 08 and now we have the pandemic of 2020 right so hopefully organizations will get over this hump first second they'll then reassess their ability to be agile right and so there's no better time uh, than for us change agents who really want to see positive ways of working and for people to be happy in their jobs and delivering value to their customers um, to reiterate that need for agility. As time has gone on, right, as we shifted towards this need for the whole organization to be agile, right, our role as a change agent has changed. Sure, we're still focused on uh, team agility because they're at the heart of any agile transformation and any agile movement. But our lens has to be much broader nowadays if we really truly want to drive sustaining everlasting change, right? We have to have more of a systems focus. And when I say systems, I'm talking about the end to end delivery of value across the, the organization, right? Aligning people to a customer so that things can be moved through that system very fast. Transformation mastery, we have to be um, students of the game, right? Be able to pull from different disciplines such as agile, lean, systems thinking, design thinking, we go on and on there, but to really formulate a strategy for the organization that's fit for purpose. We need to be able to coach and influence the people that make decisions. Um, and be able to guide them and think in a different way. Um, the improvements now come out of the team level. And they're, well, they're still going on at the team level, but we're starting to look at enterprise-wide improvements and experiment ideas to help organizations resolve issues at that highest level. So you can see the magnitude that we can have as change agents um, on the bottom line when we have a systems focus and we focus more on business agility, our, our change efforts can be, can be really, really powerful and, and our impact um, can be immense. The issue here, and I'm sure many of you ran into it because it is a common pattern that 
we're seeing as Agilist is this is systemic change and systemic change needs leadership. It requires leadership because they're the only ones that can change structure, that can change process, that can change culture, you know, top down. Um, so this type of change requires leadership support, 100%. So our, one of our best friends really should be this idea of metrics and data, not to necessarily drive uh, performance and improve, well, improvements, but, but more to, to th start telling a story to leaders, right? Because leaders, I've never met any C-suite leader, maybe VP and above, that doesn't really depend on their data or want their data, right, and metrics. So we, as change agents, because we need them, we need their support, we need to be able to leverage that data to help tell a story and to paint the picture of where the issues are within the system, right, um, to drive that story and also be able to, to tell, tell the story and tie it to the outcomes that they want to achieve as leaders. Um, so again, shifting the conversation away from um, we want to be agile to we want to achieve these transformational outcomes. Here's practices that will enable us to achieve it. Here's systemic impediments or blockers that are preventing us from achieving that. It's more of, some, it's, it's, a, it's a way to identify uh, and resonate with, with leadership um, and be able to use data in that light. So I just wanna take a poll and, and, and get the pulse of the audience um, to see who's participating today and just to get a, a feel for, uh, you know, whether or not you've used Agile assessments in the past, um, and if so, what was really the driving force behind there? Um, and so, Jay, I believe you have this um, poll for the audience, if you can put it up. Thank you. So you can take a second just to answer. Um, it'll help kind of drive um, some of my talking points going forward and where to focus and where not to. Yeah, Michael, define Agile assessments. Sure, sure. So really talking about um, whether you're assessing an agile team on their practices, um, whether it be collaboration amongst the team, um, scrum ceremonies, um, you could be assessing leadership about are they enabling, um, what's their mindset, you could be assessing roles. But really, I guess what I'm really focused on in this one would be more the teams. Are you assessing how agile teams are? Are they doing kind of the tried and true um, uh, practices that'll drive that'll drive those agile behaviors? While we're waiting, to um, Michael, to, to Nosima asked transformation mastery and business agility. Can you explain more with an example? Sure, sure. So transformation mastery comes from Lisa Atkins um, coaching model. And it really talks about, um, you know, the strategy that you're going to use to drive as a change agent to drive change throughout the whole enterprise. Right. So when you tie that to business agility, um, you're going to want to pull from a whole bunch of different I call them disciplines, methodologies, you know, whatever you want to call them, um, to help formulate a strategy that everyone will align to that'll help you drive change. Um, so it's really kind of being that um, enterprise coach, um, being able to influence leadership, um, and being able to kind of keep the North Star in mind, that vision to help us continue to march towards kind of that goal. Um, and when you tie it to business agility, hopefully organizations are realizing that they now need to be agile as an organization. Um, and the improvements go well beyond just standing up agile teams. It talks about um, funding, right? Is our funding, uh, does our funding accommodate agile, right? 
Um, performance metrics. Do, do they, uh, is it team related instead of individual related? Um, are our vendor contracts agile? This is really about things that you're thinking through um, that can help you influence and come up with a strategy to help you transform uh, so you're more agile as a business. Okay, so it looks like we have our results. Thanks for responding. It looks like about half of our audience has used them before. Um, and, you know, in the traditional sense to identify team improvements, craft a coaching plan to help them. Um, I've also used that in my, in my past. Um, I think it's great that it sounds like some people here have used uh, assessments exactly the way I'm going to explain them. So I guess that'll be some interesting conversation. Um, all of the above. Uh, it's kind of good that we didn't get any of the uh, leadership told me to, <laughs> um, because uh, the reality is in my coaching career over 10 years, I've seen that uh, a bunch of times. Um, and then a, a, um, a, a minority that really hasn't used them and just wants to learn about them. So this is good. This is perfect. I hope we can share kind of different experiences um, about the methods because we use our methods, obviously. Um, to drive change and, and how they can be improved in different areas. So thanks for answering that. All right, so the benefits of an agile team assessment, right, or a team assessment in general. So let's talk about the traditional sense. Um, we talked a little bit about them. The reality is assessing teams is really, in their mind, an easy improvement model uh to to consume right it's hey we get together once a quarter we take a assessment um a credible assessment um and we have rich conversation around where we can improve organically and where we need leadership's help right um what's also nice about assessments is the reality is most organizations um are really stretched when it comes to coaches, right? You may have a thousand teams for 25 coaches or whatever it may be. But typically the ratio that I typically see is like one to four or one to six or one to eight. And a lot of times there's, we don't know where to spend our time. So actually doing an assessment um, allows you to identify coaching needs. And it's, it's actually a simple way to collect the data. Uh, I know organizations have used Excel, Google Forms, um, and obviously, I have a platform that allows you to easily collect the data. Um, so the whole point that I, that I want to try to get across today is that, you know, for the overhead that's involved in doing agile assessments, um, if used properly, there's really a ton of value that can be gained. And so on top of those traditional benefits that we've seen, um, what I found over my career and the reason that this came about, I think it's important to note, was that I was a consultant. Um, and so every client I went into, I would understand their needs. I would I want to understand what they want to achieve. Um, I would understand their current state. And I would craft kind of an assessment that will help them um, improve to get where they wanted to go. And that assessment didn't look, look the same for any one of my clients. Because what we've learned over the years, if there's one thing we've learned, definitely in the Agile community, it's not one size fits all. Um, so I was constantly changing the different types of questions to drive um, the different outcomes that they wanted. Because as a change agent, that's what I'm trying to do. And there's no better way to do that, but with self-assessments and allowing the team to figure it out for themselves, right? Coaching 101. So asking questions and allow them to self-assess themselves. Um, and with a strong facilitator, uh, you can really probe and abstract those misinterpretations and assumptions that um, team members have and really have that rich conversation that every team needs to improve. Um, so I'm a big believer in self-assessments, not necessarily coach assessments. It does depend on, on maybe where teams are at in their maturity level. Some of our clients do coach assessments maybe for new teams and then have them transition into self-assessments because um, the coach is no longer around and that's a great organic, organic way to, for them to improve. The other thing that really um, 
extra value of assessments, and this is really the tie, the tie in the business agility, is if you actually build an assessment and you assess the right things, you assess the things that are going to help you drive to your outcomes, you can then look at that at, in a rolled up um, view, right? An aggregate view of, let's say, 10 teams in a business unit and really start to see the patterns that are preventing you from achieving uh, agility at the, at the enterprise level, business agility, right? Because the reality is the teams can improve. It'll drive organic improvements about, hey, we need to do a better, better, um, better job at retrospectives or we need to update our working agreements. These are all things that are in their control and there's value in that. But the reality is the biggest value is in those systemic issues that are holding them back. Um, and being able to look across the enterprise and, and see those patterns and be able to have the conversations with leadership um, about those patterns that, that are require, right? Because systemic change requires leadership that require their input um, and, and their championing of, of that change, right? So A, on top of the traditional benefits, we should be building assessment templates um, based off of context and outcomes, right? We shouldn't be burdening teams with 36 questions in which 15 aren't relevant to them. I would rather give them 15 that are spot on and going to help drive improvement. Um, we should be focusing more on self-assessments, driving rich conversation. It's an invitation to improve. It gives every team member stake in the game. And then finally, being able to roll these things up in a methodical way so that you can glean insights from a systemic point of view that you can then engage leadership and say, we have these systemic problems in which we need your help. Right. So this is kind of something that's been, this is like an experience report, something that I've used um, during my consulting career, something I constantly found myself up against and realized that I felt there was a need for a platform that can help drive these different types of conversations. And that's what clean agile intelligence is all about. Um, just a disclaimer here. This is really about the approach. I want to make sure all your participants get value out of understanding the approach. And then the platform's kind of an added bonus where it really facilitates the approach. But I wanna share the learnings about kind of the components of that approach and how it can be leveraged in many different ways. It's not necessarily it has to do with, with the platform. Um, all right, so I am hoping that if you're involved in a transformation, it is outcome driven. And what I mean by that is um, that your agile transformations goal is to be agile, right? Because that can mean a lot of different things. Instead, it should be um, that we have these enterprise goals, we have this strategy, we have this vision on where we're going. Um, we have KPIs that are gonna help us measure ourselves. And then from there, that should really inform a transformation approach, um, which historically what I've used, and I know that many of my colleagues have used, and I've talked with other people in the community, it's really about establishing a transformation vision, right? Where are we going? What does success look like? Uh, some type of business case, lean, lean business case around, um, why are we doing this? How are we gonna measure ourselves and hold ourselves accountable? And then some type of transformation committee, leadership committee that's going to help us champion this um, and hold the organization accountable to that change. Uh, that, then, that then derives some type of transformation strategy. Some consultants or coaches will come in and help you kind of lay that plan out in a roadmap, which ultimately leads to a transformation backlog, which I like to say is the work of the transformation, right? Um, and Typically, you'll have some enterprise coaches at that level giving you some ideas about how we can change, right? To me, this is uh, transformation 101. What's the objectives? What's the outcomes we want to achieve? And then let's figure out the practices and experiment with the practices that will enable us to do it. Where we come in and where the assessment strategy comes in is it enables um, 
that strat enables that that transformation strategy. It's a piece of it that you can use to get immediate feedback from the teams um, about what their problems are. Right. So the main anchor point here is right. The strategy is really focused on what are we going to assess on and who, right? And that's going to be informed by, you know, what you're trying to achieve. What are your desired outcomes? What does success look for, like? How are you measuring yourself, right? So whenever you do an agile assessment, it shouldn't be an off-the-shelf assessment, right? Because we all know it's not one size fits all. Instead, it should be something that's going to help you drive and improve upon um, the outcomes that you want to achieve. Uh, when do we assess? So how often do you feel um, we should be taking these assessments? And really then, assessments aren't about scores. The whole point of Agile assessments is about driving improvement. Um, and there's a, using assessments, you can have a structured approach to improvement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how we've used that in the past um, and really kind of get our bang for the buck at the s system level, um, why the teams also organically improve. So this is kind of a vanilla part of our strategy, but when you peel it back, um, there's a couple different components of this that I'm going to drill down into. Um, and again, it really just ties up to the who and what first on this side. Okay, so structure. Where do you want to see these aggregate roll-ups that will allow you to glean um, patterns and insights? Right? Is that the business level? Uh, uh, is that the at the business unit level? Is that at the enterprise level? Um, program level? It could be certain things, but the idea here is like, where are you going to get the most ammunition to drive change? Right? And where do you want to see those roll-ups? So, Michael. Um, Yes. Okay. So looks like you're going to through this so you can answer the question, but I'll just give you the question. So it looks like you're going to answer it. It's like, what's the difference between an assessment and a retrospective? Okay. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just, Jay, if you want to, yeah, it's probably a good, t good opportunity to stop and, and answer some questions. Right. Um, the a retrospective is the team gets together and reflects upon what went on, Yep, thanks. You know, what, how can we improve on, you know, what went wrong on the past, the past sprint? How can we improve what, what went well? Um, it's really at a smaller scale. Assessments are typically, agile team assessments are typically done on a quarterly basis. Um, and it really looks at kind of, call it a retrospective on steroids, right? It looks at a couple different areas that sometimes will not be covered during a retrospective because you may not have the trigger to talk about it. What an agile assessment does is it sets the context to really self-assess, right? Kind of outside of the last sprint, right? Basically, your, your window is the team itself and how long it's been together and really reflect on some areas that you probably wouldn't reflect on during retrospectives. What's really nice is the tie between the two of them. You can imagine that if you do an agile assessment once a quarter, that's gonna drive improvements, okay? Improvements that you're gonna to wanna to make over the next assessment cycle, which again is typically a quarter. As you retrospect each sprint, you're gonna make these kind of minor adjustments but the big picture is still where are we improving as a team and what can we do this upcoming sprint to actually achieve those goals. Um, so an example would be that teams don't always reflect on their team dynamics, such as accountability, collaboration, um, communication, because it's a really difficult thing to talk about, especially in um, you know, younger, more teams that are just starting. Well, in any Agile assessment, they're assessed on areas like that. And it could actually uncover some misinterpretations or assumptions, and it'll drive those conversations that probably wouldn't have happened without the assessment. 
You then have, hey, we have to improve our collaboration. As part of that, we need to update our working agreements. So every sprint retrospective, you can start thinking about, well, how do we need to update those uh, working agreements, right? Based off of the last sprint and based off of the bigger conversation around we need to improve collaboration. So I hope, uh, so the difference is that they're done a little bit different frequently, right? Retrospectives on a sprint level, uh, assessments on a quarter level. They drive different types of conversation, but yet they are linked. Jay, any more questions? You there, Jay? Uh, sorry, let's see. Uh, focus on outcomes. Yeah, no more questions. Uh, I think. Um, uh, I think the key difference there is self-assessments versus retrospectives, but I think everyone understands, and Michael, that assessments at the organizational level, uh, at, at be it functional level and multiple teams level has a different uh, perspective to it than the team level. So that's another important characteristic I would consider. Yeah. So, so Michael, you're focused on outcomes and, uh, and and the outcomes you want to achieve. I presume those outcomes are coming from leadership because you called out leadership as um, the as, as the required driver to make that kind of change. But do you see, you know, what what outcomes do you see leadership calling out aside from we want more productivity? <laughs> um, well, I definitely see that. Let's say let's say that, or I want to make more money, right? Um, give me a second and we'll get to that, right? So there's a way that we help drive um, forward transformational outcomes, I call them, Ron, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with them, you know, custom satisfaction, uh, reliability. Is, is that just me or did Michael go wonky? Am I still wonky? Uh, better now. Okay. Um, Thank you. What I'm talking about is making sure that leadership on there's a coaching aspect here, right? And making sure that leadership understands the product what bring productivity down into um, some components, right? Do they want to be able to respond to change? Do they want to be more reliable? Sure, they want to be all of them. Do they want to be predictable? Do they want to be innovative? Typically, the answer is we want to be all of them. The reality is you need to kind of come up with a strategy that will um, focus on a couple of them at a time, right? Um, and typically what I've seen and what I've coached is let's get the business and technology collaborating, right? Let's, let's start driving towards the customer instead of a plan. Let's be able to respond to change, right? And so when we draft an assessment, um, it's going to drive some prices that will allow us to achieve those. Does that answer your question? Uh, we didn't get the last part because your your audio is totally breaking up. Is it breaking up for everybody? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, hold on one. The second. comments are also reflecting that. And, and the last two sentences you just said were fine, so it's going back and forth. Okay, it's it's really windy and and uh, here in Philadelphia, and I'm wondering if because I am right in next to my route, I'm wondering if that has something to do with it. Uh, what about now? Good for now. All right. Thank, good. thank you. All right, so I'm going to move on, um, and then we can come back to that conversation because uh, it, the next couple slides are going to tie in. All right, so, so first we're talking about the who, right? Um, and before we actually go in there, let me cover this first because I didn't realize I didn't cover it. So when we looked at that strategy, this really focused on the who and the what, right? And when we talk about structures, really talk about 
we're going to access and at what levels do we want to see roll up so we can identify patterns. Um, we're then going to craft out um, questions and it's really going to be geared on what do we want to assess, right? Both of these are informed by your transformational strategy, which hopefully you have some type of enterprise coaches that are coaching leadership to determine what outcomes they're seeking, how they're going to measure them, uh, and what's the strategy to kind of, kind of gain the most improvement. Um, so that's really what we're talking about here with the, the who and the what. We're talking about how do you structure your enterprise and how do you want to see roll-ups? Typically, I see it at the enterprise, at the business unit level. And then what do you want to assess your teams on? Um, what, are, what are the questions going to comprise of? Uh, is there a set of core practices plus extended? We'll get into that. Um, you then kind of look at what levels are we going to assess? Are recommended levels from, from bottom up? It's always nice to look at the individual roles and how they're growing, right? So they self-assess themselves. Um, take a look at the team, obviously. Uh, that's going to help drive some organic improvements as well as to uh, be able to identify some other patterns. If you have large programs or large products, right, you probably want to have some type of collaboration assessment between those two about, about how they're collaborating and working together. Um, and then to me, what we've seen in the industry over the past few years is really having leadership, you know, drink their own champagne, right? Eat their own dog food, actually test themselves um, and really find out whether or not what their, what, how their mindset has to change. I can tell you 60% of our clients are now doing leadership assessments. Um, and we'll talk about a few examples. Uh, and then finally, so go ahead. Sorry, this is Jay. So one of the recommendations, I don't know if you can try this, because you're breaking up every now and then, but then you have periods where it's very solid, is right. to maybe call in using the phone and see if that helps with the audio. You got it. And then make sure your stuff uh, is on mute or we'll get that, yep. that crazy, you know, audio. All right, give me a second. Thank sure. you, Michael. Let me know if you need the number. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound.
Enter your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, pound. press pound to continue. You are in the meeting now. There are more than 20 participants. In the meeting. In the this meeting is being recorded. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, you have to turn your. Uh, you have to turn off your mic. Yeah. yeah. What about now? Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm just going to lay my phone down right here. Can you still hear me okay? Yes. Sounds All great. Right, Big improvement. Good. All right, good. Thanks for bringing that to my attention. All right. So we were, where we were at was we were talking a little bit about, you know, coming up with just the recap coming up with an agile assessment strategy to really help drive your transformational outcomes, right? It's really what it, it's at the crux of this whole thing. Um, so it's about identifying what to assess, right? And obviously there's usually coaching involved there. It's identifying who to assess and it's identifying how we can use the results to drive improvements at the team level and at the enterprise level. And what we're really talking about in terms of this is the systemic ch changes that are needed um, that'll go up to the enterprise level and that will require leadership's attention, right? So for example, um, we had a client that was using uh, the platform who realized that they um, didn't have the tooling in place uh, to really enable DevOps. Right, so many of the teams were assessing themselves on DevOps, and what came about was the tooling wasn't sufficient enough to enable what they wanted to achieve. So this was a good way when they saw 10 or so teams having the same problem, um, and they, that actually triggered them to analyze their tool set uh, and then come up with how to, the, you know, improving that tool set, right? Um, and that's just one example of what we've seen. Tooling is always a good systemic issue. Resources is always a good systemic issue. Put, uh, performance funding are systemic issues that typically when the ecosystem doesn't align to enabling the teams, um, that's something that requires leadership support um, to help enable, right? So, when we talk about getting the results for these assessments, we talk to, we can drill down into individual teams. Um, we can drill up and look at the group level. And it really drives what we call three levels of improvement. You have your level one, which is self-contained um, improvement on the team level, things that they can control, constantly retrospecting, right, and identifying improvements um, such as team collaboration, backlog management, um, you know, work in progress is another great example. So there are things that the team can get. The second level of constraints is typically, hey, we need training in somewhere. Um, maybe our developers don't have TDD training. Um, and we can see that a bunch of them are struggling with that. And maybe there's some center of excellence or maybe you have to bring in consultants that do the TDD. So we call them constraint patterns um, that, you know, typically are handled at the business unit level uh, or at the COE level. There could be one in the same. Everybody's different. And the third one is really the systemic issues. Um, team, like I said, funding, team performance, tooling. These are things that have to go up the chain um, and really get evaluated on how they're impacting you know, the flow of value and the, and the desired outcomes that the organization wants to achieve. So we'll talk a little bit more about them, but I just wanted you to understand how the, all of this fits together as a recap. All right, so the who, aggregation points and assessment levels. Um, so if all organizations are different. A lot of our clients will just do teams. 
Um, like I said, 60% of our clients assess leadership as well now. Um, we actually offer a leadership assessment. Um, and we've, uh, a lot of the feedback has been, we had a one client um, about literally, I guess, four months ago. It helped identify, they took the assessment several times. They weren't really improving. And it really kind of drove um, them that there was some type of leadership training that was needed. Right. And that's, you know, is it a big step? Eh, I don't know. Right. But it's at least a step in the right direction about how they need to change their mindset. So they brought in a Cal, uh, Scrum Alliance Cal trainer, and they did, the, they did the training because they didn't necessarily realize how their mindset also has to shift. Right. So that was one example that we've seen of how the leadership uh, assessment has driven change. And, and we tell our leadership um, teams to take the assessment just like teams take it. Um, and that's in a real time self assessment um, environment, which I'll show you in a minute, but a really driving um, conversation. Right. So um, some folks will do team to team assessments. Um, whether they're using SAFE or whatever scaling framework they have. Um, however, a lot of our clients actually just use three or four team of team questions within their team assessments so they don't make them do them twice. Um, and then obviously individual roles. Uh, we've seen a movement over the past two or three years about um, a couple different things, right? Getting a 360 kind of peer review. Um, so using role specific assessments to do that, such as product owner and scrum master, um, as well as to drive kind of a self growth plan that's really anchored to um, anchored to, you know, a assessment or, you know, a credible, a credible source. I'm going to bounce over to LAI and just take a second to kind of show you how we do it. Um, again, here is uh, you know, that grouping that we talked about, and you can see, this is just an example. You can see that this is broken up at the bank. It's broken up into business units, and there's multiple teams under each unit, okay? And if you drill down into the specific team, I'm just going to show you our core dashboard. Uh, you can see uh, in this spider graph how the team has improved over time. Those trend lines are um, points in time that they've taken an assessment, right? Um, so you can see from a team perspective, you know, where they're improving and where they're not. If you click on the group, then it's going to take all of the assessment results underneath. It's going to normalize the data and it's going to show you um, how the group is doing. Um, and so this is kind of that structure that I, that I was talking about. And we do have some clients that actually use it at the release train level as well. And really when we coach them, the, the probing question is, where do you feel the roll-ups will, you will gain the most insights to help you drive change? Um, so this is kind of what I'm talking from a structure standpoint uh, about um, how you can see the different roll-ups. And we, we, you can have groups of groups, and you, we roll all the way up to the organization level. Um, and you can just see like how that works and how you can see trends. So that's just something that I wanted to show you a real-life example of. Um, this here is where actually two or three of our newer clients um, have really taken it, where they're breaking down a business unit, and then they're breaking down in subgroups leadership teams and roles. And this is allowing them to see roles at the business unit level, but also um, to drill down into the leadership level, team level, individual roles. Um, so depending on where you're at in the organization as a team coach or maybe an enterprise coach, um, you're able to kind of, you know, use the platform to gather insights that'll help drive your coaching plan based off of what you're accountable for. All right, so we kind of talked about the what and the who, right? What are we going to accept, or, or the who, right? And what levels we're going to assess. What I want to focus on now is the what we are going to assess. And this is really focused on building out that template 
of questions. I call them practices. Any agile assessment you see typically um, is focused on a specific practice. For example, um, sprint planning. You know, uh, are you getting together once a once a sprint? Uh, are do you have a sprint goal? Um, you know, is the product owner engaged? Are they able to ask questions? How ready is your backlog? Those sort of things. Um, so when we talk about building out an assessment template, we actually coach our clients on using this idea of core plus extended. Because what we found over the years is that the organization really has a core set of practices they want to get better at. And typically it's the it's the non-negotiable self-organization, cross-functionality, continuous integration, definition of done, core practices, I would call them. This is just an example uh, from a specific client. But just so you understand, all of those questions are adopted by every unit in the organization. And then the unit has the autonomy to actually extend the template based off of their context, right? So for example, um, the payments group uh, in a bank that we support, they, their extended practices focus on technical excellence, quality, reliability, because they're a mission critical payments application. That's a perfect example where we've seen context help drive um, the adoption and the shaping of a template. Um, so yeah, again, we're trying to get to a point where we're trying to find the best of both worlds. We don't want to put a, a template on a team with questions that are irrelevant to them or aren't going to add value. These th the assessments typically take anywhere from t about an hour to two hours. We want to make sure we optimize the value. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, and then we're, pr we're providing them the autonomy to extend that. And I think it's hard to argue that we need self-organization. We need cross-functionality. So, these are all things that really need to be embedded in everything we do. Therefore, it's okay to assess all teams on that um, and then allow them to extend it based off of their needs and maturity and where they're at. So that's the who, the what, right? Assessments are, are taking, um, we, we encourage quarterly, I'm assuming, that most organizations that I've seen have, have really wanted to do them at a quarterly level. The one thing that I'll show you here, um, I believe in taking assessments in a real-time fashion um, because what I've found over the years is that whenever someone takes an assessment, they, um, they you know, if you review the results, <laughs> let's say a, a month later or two weeks later or even a week, um, what happens is they really forget about why they voted the way they did, right, in a self-assessment. So what I'm going to launch here is a, a real-time assessment screen um, that we've used that, you know, hopefully you can see. And you can do a fist of five. It doesn't necessarily need to be this platform. Um, but the whole idea here is that you want to assess teams and drive that real-time conversation. So you can imagine that everyone would log in. You would, you would prompt the, the question for Agile planning. They would all provide their vote. And in a very real-time planning poker-esque way, we give you your lowest, your highest, and your average simply for the sake of driving conversation. Um, and Really, we've gotten most of our clients to actually utilize this method instead of the traditional, which we support, um, kind of offline, individual-based. I take the assessment. When everybody's done, we get the results. The conversations are not nearly as rich, um, and uh, the improvements that come out of those aren't nearly as um, powerful. Uh, from what we've seen. And the feedback from, I would say, 90% of our clients is they get much more value in facilitating an assessment in this way. Um, why I'm here, real fast, uh, I just want to show you, uh, I, did, I did not have a chance to show you, kind of got caught up in between there, um, how you can extend uh, assessments. Um, so one way we do it is we actually have a bank of assessment questions that you can go to and start adding to your template. 
right? And they're ba they're broken down into m different groups. Um, and again, it's really all based off of what you want to achieve and what you're driving towards. Um, our assessment question bank is up to 280 questions from focused on DevOps to uh, technical excellence, to collaboration, to um, programs, improvements, metrics, you name it. Um, and then what we do at LAI and, and the method, and, and hopefully this ties in, I think, one of the questions before, is we actually link up every question to an outcome, uh, to multiple outcomes. And that's why we call questions practices. So for example, if I click on agile planning here, um, I have, um, here is what is presented to the team. You just saw that. These are our five agility stages, we call them. And the reason that we went with this format in which we define criteria in each stage um, is again, to drive conversation amongst the team. Here's what bad looks like. Here's what good looks like, or really good looks like. Here's some things in between. How are we doing? It gives them context and real bullets to talk again about. Um, and again, it's not necessarily about the score. It's about the improvements and the conversations that come, about, come out of it. What we've also done to kind of help drive the conversation in the right way is we've tied the every practice to one or many outcomes that they directly impact. So up here at the top of the screen, you'll see seven outcomes. Um, these are derived from version one survey, State of Agile, about the reasons why CEOs are adopting Agile. Um, and so it starts to drive the question you can see of, are we assessing the right things, right, based off of our outcomes? So this percentage tells you that 33% of the questions in this assessment template impact time to market, right? Um, and so it starts to drive the, we also do it, and I'm not sure if you saw it on the results set, uh, we also do the scoring at the outcome level. Um, and what we're aiming towards here is really driving the conversation away from scores and being uh, and and doing agile to are we improving in the right things? Okay, are we improving in things that will lead to um, you know agile maturity? I see it as a leading indicator, right? It, Agile's tried and true. There's a reason 99% of the companies in the world use it. So by doing these practices, um, if you're improving in them and you complement them with quantitative numbers, right, the things that we really care about, you can probably start to point to some correlations that as a result of improving in these areas, we now are, uh, have more better predictability. Our time to market, epic cycle time is up. Our defects are going down, right? So as you improve in these practices and you tie them to quantitative metrics that most organizations will want to measure, you can start to see um, the relationship and correlation between the two. And what I like to say is, is the transformation, the improvements that are being made as part of the transformation truly moving the needle um, for what you want to achieve as a business and achieving those operational outcomes or transformational outcomes. Um, I am, it might be a good time to stop for questions, so I knew I threw a lot at you. What do you think, Jay? Yeah, so is there any questions anyone has? Um, so, Michael, about how much more are you going to cover so, they, so that people can kind of get a grasp of where we're at? I have two more slides. All right. Um, cool. and, and we can cover some questions. All right. So if there's no question, I don't see any, maybe we can just cover those and then open it up for questions right. from everybody. Sounds good. All right. So just to revisit, right? We talked about the who, the what, the when, and now really talking about how are we going to improve and those three levels of improvements. Um, so, and, and we like to call this a structured approach to improvement, right? Um, so level one, Self-contained improvements, right? Improvements that teams can 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 do on their own, 
Um, they're part of, you know, uh, they come about uh, as part of the assessment and then they're revisited during retros. Um, and some examples here that we've seen over the years, right? These are, we pulled these out. Um, these are common. Hey, we need to upgrade, update our working agreements. Uh, we need better retro exercises. Uh, our PO needs to be, be here more often. Um, these are typical things that we see in teams um, that they can identify as part of the assessment and improve upon their own. Level two, um, there is some overlap between level two and level three in that you really need someone's outside help to help push that. Um, leadership's help typically, uh, but a lot of times it may fall into uh, just that business unit level and not necessarily the enterprise level. That's really what we're referring to here. Um, so th things like uh, really shared patterns that you see across multiple teams. For example, I gave the example about the TDD. Uh, our client in Canada um, was able to identify that, you know what, we say we want to do TDD, our teams don't necessarily know how to do it, right? So they were able to set up the training, and it wasn't something that necessarily leadership had to approve, but they didn't necessarily have to remove the change. That's what I'm, or, or, or force the change. So that's what I'm talking about level two, right? Um, things that can be kind of handled within a program or a unit, and they're just patterns that you see across the organization that, um, if improved, would lead to a lot, would lead to better outcomes, right? The last one is, is kind of the systemic one where you need an ecosystem change um, within the organization at the enterprise level with senior leadership's um, support, right? Um, a lot of times, you know, I've seen in my career shared service resources, right? They're too scarce. How do we how do we bake them into our agile universe? I gave the example about the the DevOps agile tools uh, that one of our clients was able to to come to. Um, another client uh, came back and and really realized that their budget budgeting cycle is just preventing teams from being agile. For all we've seen, I'm sure, uh, as, if if any of you are enterprise coaches and been coaching for a while, these are things that that resonate. Um, so that's kind of that, that structured approach to improvement, right? Um, and that really points to, hey, once we have, you know, we're going to run those, those workshops and we're going to talk to the business unit and we're going to be able to handle any patterns here at this level. But ultimately, this really is one big circle, right? Where if we can handle them at that level and they require systemic, true systemic change, then they can be... Um, escalated up to kind of that en enterprise transformation level, become part of the backlog and become prioritized and, and start talking about ideas and improvements that we can make to, um, or experiments, I should say, that we can try uh, to, to alleviate that constraint, right? So it really shines the visibility on, um, on those constraints especially when you're able to tie them back to the outcomes that you want to achieve. So instead, it's not, this team's not doing this right. Instead, it's, this team's unable to do this because of these systemic issues, right? And as a result, it's impacting our bottom line and the outcomes we want to achieve. And therefore, we need, need, to, need to figure out a way how to handle them. Different conversation. Um, than you know I had eight years ago when I was doing team assessments uh, in the beginning of my coaching career. All right, so so final comments. I like to keep it simple, right, and to kind of bring it back down to to, to reality, right. We're talking about business agility today. It's real. The pandemic's here. It's never been more real. Um, strategic agility, operation agility, everything is needed. Um, a lot of the changes required are systemic. Um, systemic change uh, requires leadership. They're the only ones that have the authority to change the system. Um, and sure, we can have organic grassroots approaches, but it, they take a long time, right? Um, so to truly get there and accelerate that, you need leadership support. Leadership typically depends on data and metrics. 
Um, they rely on it. They're, 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 they're held accountable to it. Um, so we can use the change agents um, data to help drive the conversation um, as change agents where we really want our impact to be felt and, and, and start changing the system. Um, one easy way to do that is team assessments, self uh, team self-assessments, perhaps role assessments, leadership assessments, right? It's an easy way to gather the data, right? And then be able to kind of roll that up and highlight those impediments to have the intelligent conversation with leadership about some of the issues that they're seeing from, and the teams are um, are giving them that feedback, right? This is the, the teams are the ones doing the work. Uh, they're the ones closest to the work. Uh, you want their feedback. And when you see patterns of that feedback, um, there's a lot of validity to that and they really need to be addressed. Um, so that's it. Um, the really, you know, kind of talk about the approach behind lean agile intelligence. Um, I showed you a little bit of the platform um, and it facilitates this method. And this is something that a lot of our clients are, are having success with, a little bit of a different approach uh, to agile assessments. So I'll open it up for questions. Hopefully you found value in this. I uh, apologize for the uh, technical difficulties. Glad I was able to pivot and be agile. Um, but yeah, any, any questions, uh, I'm happy to stick around. Okay, so I'll open up the questions. If you have a question, there's only 22 people. You can unmute yourself and then uh, ask the question. Uh, well, you know, one thing I was, Michael, I know that uh, there is some exploratory work, work you're working with a client on the product discovery side and innovation side uh, that you're looking at, uh, I don't know, integrating or having part of the platform is, is do you want to share anything there? Um, yeah, I'm actually, I'm actually taking a look at, um, some of the questions that, or the conversation that was being had, uh, over the, uh, over the chat, right, where I believe, uh, Ron asked about productivity, um, and then Jerome chimed in about predict, pre predictability. Um, maybe you guys can shed some light on that conversation about your, your experiences. Um, well, I'm going to jump in there. I, I didn't pose the predictability topic, but uh, it, it certainly most organizations place some value on predictability, so, you know, because they need to ask, answer the question, when will this be available? Because they've got a market introduction or a customer commitment or, or whatever, right? So predictability is generally high on the list of outcomes that that uh, leaders would like to have from organizations. Uh, does that, I'm, I'm, that's my context for what was suggested. Yeah, David. Yeah, I'll, go Sorry. Ahead. Nope, go ahead. Uh, oh, I just hear what, yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say that, that was my experience in it, uh, was, you know, similar to uh, what was initially mentioned. Uh, where I had previously worked, we had situations where predictability was one of the things too. So it just made me think of that as, as we were talking in the chat. Yeah. So, so from my experience, from a coaching standpoint, um, predictability um, requires some really core things, right? Like durable teams, stop shifting people around. Um, technical, uh, high technical practices, right? Uh, efficient technical practices, quality baked in, automation. Um, so actually, when you start to talk about predictability, uh, I, I see reliability really as um, one of the core uh, outcomes. I call them anchor outcomes. That if you have reliability and you focus on the quality practices, 
um, the product of that is predictability. If you don't necessarily have automation and you do some manual testing and you have some a lot of technical debt, most likely you're not going to have predictability. So instead of focusing on predictability, you need to focus on the things that's going to lead to predictability. Typically, that's things like reliability as well as durable teams. Yeah, in my experience, that was we had issues with all those things, uh, people being moved around, uh, very little automation in place. So you're you're speaking to me right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and to go back to, I think I saw a comment in, in the chat, um, you know, leadership doesn't often know what they want. Right. Um, and to me, it's really about, you know, kind of zeroing in, not, not assuming, you know, what they want, really trying to figure out and, and clarify that, have them prioritize the different outcomes that they want. Right. Um, can you, can you work on different outcomes parallel? Sure. Right, but there has to be a strong focus in areas. So, for exa example, if you want innovation, um, you know, a lot of organizations are spinning up innovation units now, right? Because they realize that they're just not getting innovation within the, you know, the operative teams that have always operated, even though they're using Scrum, right? It's kind of business as usual. So, it's really about are they willing to make the investment in doing the right thing to help drive that outcome, right? Are they willing to make a small bet, maybe a big bet, um, in, in kind of agile and really truly living by agile? Um, and what we've done historically in LAI is really drive towards uh, one of the things I'll show you. Let me just bounce over to our results set. Actually, I'll go here. And I can show you exactly kind of how we um, drive the conversation. And here's a good example, right? So you have a, a, a company that, or a team, actually, let me click on the group, that you can see in this example, they're not improving in quality, right? They are, they, and they have, we have this concept in LAI called an impediment in goal. A goal is really simple. The, the team says, we, we want to get to the next level in the next uh, assessment cycle. Um, an impediment is we are unable to get to the next level um, because of something out of our control, right? So if you look here, you can see that this team uh, is not improving, right? They have, they're not trending up at all in quality. And you can see they have a whole bunch of these quote unquote impediments. If you start to go over them, you can see the multiple teams are impacted by these impediments. Um, so if the organization says we want to be predictable, just to use that example, and we know reliability and predictability are clo closely correlated, we can easily point out and say, you have 29 impediments within your environment that are preventing reliability. So again, this is about driving that conversation, not necessarily on agile scores and we want to be agile, but towards, say you want to be predictable. We know we've proven there's a strong correlation between technical excellence, reliability, and predict predictability, right? Here's where we need your help. And uh, it's a different conversation, right? One that, you know, mature leaders can have. Um, and you'll really start to see the change. Until you can get to that level, a lot of this stuff just ends up being lip service. Stuff being that organizations want to change. Any, any other questions? Yeah, this is, uh, any other questions? Let, just speak up, unmute. Hey, I have a question. This is Andrew. Oh, uh, yeah, I find this all very interesting. Um, I have a question specifically about the leadership quadrant, because I think in my years of doing this, it's the most important one. Um, 
I kind of want to know your, what is your overall approach or uh, theory to approaching leadership? Um, I guess kind of what I've found is somewhat successful is you look for people who are deliverers, you know, the, the ones who are actually on the hook to deliver something, value, a product, a process, um, and identify those people as kind of conduits to management if you don't have a direct line to them. And I think that those, those four uh, things that you have listed under the leadership, the safety, self-org, support, and team facilitation, um, every team I've found that's, going, that's willing to go through this journey, um, they have a person or they have people on the team or around the team that have that mindset or some experience. They also have the ear of the executives, which you're ultimately trying to um, you know, get, get in your trust. Um, so how do you approach that sort of, I guess, I don't know, how do you approach the leadership or what is your theory of approaching the leadership so that you can have that sort of distribution of mindset, if you will? Yeah, sure. Um, so given my experience from a coaching standpoint, um, it's really the executives kind of, they're so high up, they don't really understand the low level stuff that happens at the team level. They, they, they read Harvard business review. They know they, you know, they know that teams have to be self-organizing in this day and age. You gotta be able to respond to change, yada, yada, yada. Right. It's the real, the real crux of the problem. I think we've seen it, a common pattern in the industry is really at the middle manager le level. And what, what I've found is they, they simply resist mainly because um, they're just kind of scared for their job. Right. Um, and so as coaches and consultants, we have to have empathy for them. Uh, you know, here's someone that's probably worked their whole life to go up the corporate ladder only to be told that, you know, that their job is to enable self-organizing teams. Right. And it's a, it's a completely different thing and, and they they get concerned. Um, so from a leadership perspective, you have to first put yourselves kind of in that their shoes. Um, and if you don't have direct contact to them, you want to coach the people that do, <laughs> um, and, and start, you also at the leadership level want to start using metrics at, and, it, and it doesn't even have to be assessments, right? Metrics is a, is a change agent's best friend. Um, you just have to make sure that you use them in the right way. Uh, you can never look at one metric individually. You always got to look at several different ones because they're going to pull on one another. Um, you can't re necessarily use them as a performance tool. It's an improvement tool. So there's some coaching there. Um, but once you start to show the improvement that's being made in the system, right, and, and, and you're actually able to coach them because you understand their situation, um, and there really truly is a role for leadership in this, in this space, right, then th it definitely comes with the culture and it takes a little longer. Um, but I guess my advice would be um, have empathy for those folks, um, form relationships, um, use metrics to help drive the conversation, and then let them realize themselves that, that this is something that is beneficial for them as well. Um, I did mention that we have a leadership assessment. So some of the things that, so typically at organizations, uh, we interact um, directly with like a center, Agile Center of Excellence, who's really geared towards driving change throughout the organization. And one of the things that they have found successful is to get leadership engaged in this. Because what the leadership doesn't understand is they're a key piece of this whole puzzle. They see it as a Agile as a delivery mechanism, scrum, right, process. But really, this is about enabling the whole organization, we talked about business agility, right? We talked about the things that are needed. So to kind of shine the light on that, um, some organizations have adopted our leadership assessment. Um, and really, and, they, and the leadership team sits down and takes this assessment by themselves. They come up with their own improvement plan. And it really starts to highlight and they start to understand, wow, we really have a role in this. And it's a super shift in mindset. Um, and, uh, you know, because I've heard and I've lived it for the past 10 years. Uh, any agile transformation, right, 
the ones that are successful are enabled by leadership and um, and supported by leadership. It's always have to be it has to be top down, bottom up, kind of meet in the middle. Um, but the ones that are successful are, are typically that. So hopefully that helps. Um, hopefully you can use that in your toolkit um, and use uh, use some of that advice. Anything else? Yeah, um, Michael, the um, uh, the the wrap up you've given us around using these assessment tools uh, is really interesting. Um, I've run across two of them now, so I wasn't aware of Lean Agile Intelligence until today. Um, I was aware of one called Agile Health that Sally Alada does, and it seems like they're somewhat similar. Are you working basically in the same space and how do you differentiate your tools from each other? Yeah, sure. Um, so Agility Health is a, is a big player in the space, a uh, successful company, good, good spirited company, uh, good mission, good, do great work. The difference really between us and them, the way we differentiate ourselves is we allow organizations to customize the assessment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so with, Agility Health, there's 36 questions that every team has to take, right? Um, and, and I'm paraphrasing there. I'm sure there's, you know, I'm not here to say anything bad about them. Um, but our, our, whole, our whole value prop is you can go into here, at, into our question bank, and you can just start picking the questions that you want to, um, that you want to add. The typical use case, uh, in LAI is enterprises will start with, um, let's say, our team fundamentals assessment, right? This is our typical, it's, it's, a, it's got 36 questions in it, right? It's just like uh, Agility Health. The difference is that if this question is not, if some of these questions are not relevant to you, you can simply remove them. Right. Um, you can also create your own questions. Right. We give you a blank slate. And if there's something not in our catalog that's important to you, some organizations use this for, for their company values and principles, right, to include them in assessments. So the difference is we allow you to customize your assessment. We tie all of our the, – the, the, the driving conversation is – the premise behind it is are you assessing the right things? So we also show you a guiding light of, you know, what what outcomes are you going to impact based off of this assessment, right? That that level of thinking I don't think happens in any other assessment tool. The last piece of the puzzle that I'll highlight is you can always go into our questions, um, copy them, and this is a very very common use case because I know as good as I do, our agile languages between organizations are always different. Your features, my epic, is somebody else's story, right? And so what this allows them to do is kind of tweak the language so they're not causing any confusion within the, within the assessment, right? So our value prop and the reason that organizations adopt our, our product um, is because um, of the customization piece there's a there's a mindset that it's not one size fits all, and um, we want to be able to customize it to help drive the change that we need and what's fit for our purpose. And it might be an assessment of ten questions, not thirty six, and we're okay with that. So to to go to that customization, um, that's that's really interesting. Uh, Andrew was asking the question earlier around leadership and and the 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 assessment chart that you were showing, the spider chart, uh, had four areas of leadership. Might those four areas be five or three or different if, um, uh, if, the, if somebody customized the tool differently? That's right. If you look, um, let me just bring you over to our, to our template. If you look into um, so our question bank here on the left-hand side has the different um, sections that you saw in there. Yeah. And you can see leadership 
right? You can select these and you can add all the leadership. And that means that the leadership, um, uh, you know, the leadership pies, if you will, will be, will be more in the, in the results, right? Um, if you open our leadership assessment, you'll actually see that all of the questions in that assessment are geared towards leadership in the leadership category. So what you would see in the spider graph is all of leadership. Got it, thank you. Make, yep, no problem. Anything else, or does anyone want to see any other features um, of the platform, um, examples of how people are using it? Um, happy to answer that. Well, it looks right. like, yeah, it looks like everyone's satiated, Michael. If no one has any other questions, I'm very new to the Agile community and have some newbie questions, which may not be relevant to the group. So I wanted to wait until everyone else had finished. If there's extra time left over, um, Michael, I'd love to pick your brain. Absolutely. No problem. So, um, Michael, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. I was just going to say, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, do my spiel one last time. Um, if, if anyone wants to contact me, um, you can obviously uh, see, find me on LinkedIn. You can find us on our, our website is www.leanagileintelligence.com. Um, we don't constrain people from just signing up and, and giving it a spin. Um, and uh, so we, we provide a free trial, full functionality. Uh, and then we also work with, with customers who maybe need a little bit more time to, to prove the value um, of the platform and also to get them a feel for if it's something that's a good fit for them. Um, so happy to work with any of, of you folks um, in that space if you want to just give it a spin and, and, and check it out in more detail. Um, also happy to have a follow-up demo solely focused on the platform. Uh, I know I focused a lot on the approach here because I felt like that was the, some really valuable learnings that I can help contribute. Because um, to me, it's really about using this data to drive the right conversation um, to truly get the value. So um, again, happy to work with anyone in that regard. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I really hope that, that um, you found value in this. Feel free to post some feedback to me. Um, we, I like to practice what I preach as far as um, taking feedback and improving. I know I can always improve in, in doing these, um, including a better uh, Wi-Fi connection. Um, but uh, no, I, I appreciate your, your, the conversations here, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. And uh, I really want to thank Michael for taking his time and, and coming and sharing all this uh, wonderful information. I, I, I do know Michael and Sally's journey uh, and uh, knew them for a while. I'm very proud of both of them. I'm very proud of Michael. I mean, he's, he's come up a long way and I really like his platform a lot. Uh, so Michael, again, thank you so much. Um, now I'm gonna transition over to opening up the Ask an Agile Coach. So this is where, you know, if you're a newbie and you have some questions. I'm sure you'll get 14 different answers, but you'll get answers. <laughs> so, so, so I will now open it up to any questions anyone may have. And it was Katie, right? Yes. Um, I'm actually very new to the Agile community. Becoming a Scrum Master is a new career transition that I'm looking to make. So at this time, I've been using my extra quarantine time to get some certifications to beef up my application as well as making my way as much as possible into Agile networks and communities. Do you have suggestions about good certifications that I could get like SAFE or JIRA 
or communities that I should be joining. Also, if anyone else in the circle has suggestions, I am open. Sure. So, listen, there's a lot of certifications out there, right? Um, and there's, there's value in them. Um, certainly, it's also valuable to have different ones. Um, so you can understand, um, you know, have a fundamental foundational understanding of, of that. Um, there's, the, we've evolved over the years from team level certifications, such as product owners, Scrum Masters, developers, and then Scrum Master 2 and <laughs> Scrum Master 3. Um, but the you know, now there's, there's agile at scale, which is really popular. And obviously you have different players in that space, right? Um, such as safe, such as less, such as uh, discipline agile and on and on and on from at scale. Um, I would really encourage you to read, um, go through the literature, talk to other folks about, um, what the certification is, um, what type of value it is, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have safe, do you need less and all that sort of thing? In my opinion, no. Um, you really just need kind of to understand the core concepts, values and principles um, mm -hmm. and practices. So, I mean, I know that's a long-winded answer because it, you know, it's, a, it's a good foundation to start, Katie. Um, but as you learn and you start to become a practitioner, you're kind of going to go on your own journey um, and you're going to learn a lot more things and, and reading, reading, like I, I could probably recommend some communities to you where cool. you really will have real life that's experiences. Great. Right. Um, and that's, that's what's important, right? To hear about like in the trenches, right? Because what you're reading at the certification level is kind of the happy path, <laughs> right? Um, and so there's, a, there's groups, uh, and I'm sure Jay can speak to this too, that you can really start th th exactly for this, right? People who um, want to share stories, want to share learnings, just like, just like we're doing today. And really you start to understand kind of the real life conceptual application of what we're talking about um, away from just, you know, a certification, if that makes sense. That, that makes sense. Um, I've heard a lot of actually advice like that, that certifications can only take you so far. If you have any communities you'd like to suggest that I can check out or later, <laughs> um, that would be wonderful. Uh, uh, so it depends on where you live, but if you, and no matter where you live, where? San Jose. I'm in the Bay. All right, cool. So go to Meetup, search for Agile, close to your. I know several that are down there. Go, you know, join them and go to them when COVID 19's over. Uh, Ron has a Meetup up there. It's more engineering oriented, though, software. But there, there is the, uh, the Agile Leadership Network uh, is there with Stacy Louie. I, for sure participate that we have ours up here there's a couple up here so those are communities that are scrum master communities you can join there's a scrum master meet up here in the bay area suggest you join that uh from from uh from a hiring side you know there's a couple of hiring managers on the call so that maybe they can speak up but we do notice that there is uh kind of a, a trend out there for hiring people so Scrum Masters, they want to see, for some reason, some certification like CSM or something like that. But as we discussed, that doesn't necessarily mean you know anything. They want to see some years of experience. We're finding out that some Scrum Masters evolve into becoming Scrum Masters in, in their current organization. So a Scrum Master role comes up, they know somebody who knows somebody there, they say, well, why don't you try to do this job? you get the job and hopefully you do successful and, and then your career starts to, starts to blossom and, and, and so forth. Um, but, uh, but there is plenty of community communities here in the Bay area. You can text me or email me and I can give you their names and you can join them. 
So now I turn over to, there's a lot of people on the call here. There's hiring managers on the call. You got Ron on the call. Maybe they can provide some advice for you as well. That would be great. If you put your email in the chat, I'd love to reach out to you. And if anyone else has thoughts, Hong and I have actually already been emailing back and forth a couple of times. Great to see him. If anyone has other thoughts on communities I should check out or steps I should take. I don't know. Uh, and Andrew, Andrew and I just pasted uh, a couple a few books that are well worth reading. Uh, uh, Joy okay. Inc. is a sort of case study from Rich Sheridan. If you haven't read that one, it's it's an easy read and it's it gives you an idea of layering straight extreme programming um, and, and really driving a, a, a company based on extreme programming, which will give you an alternative to Scrum and a realization that there are that there's a broader range of how this is done. The, um, uh, I think uh, Michael's comment about the happy path is uh, uh, about certifications leading you to the happy path is really true. Every different organization is going to adapt Scrum or extreme programming differently and uniquely to their situations and their culture and their people and their products and their executives and their the, the whole gamut of things. And, um, and it's, it's that experience with the, that broad range that really makes um, Scrum Masters excel. Um, uh, the, the certifications, ju ju uh, as Michael said, just give you the happy path of uh, this, is, this is where it begins. This is where you begin to uh, customize and configure uh, an organization's uh, uh, process. Yeah, I I would chime in my two cents as well, Katie. Um, this is Gopal. Um, you know, I completely uh, agree with uh, what um, you know what was said previously. The only thing I would add here is that look for volunteering opportunities to actually uh, after you go through the certification to see how it implements because that helps makes a difference in terms of when you're interviewing for a you know, full-time job or an actual job. So PMI has some volunteering opportunities. I'm sorry, what, what was the uh, name of the organization you said had volunteering opportunities? Because I'm actually looking for those. Yeah, PMI, uh, Project yeah. Management Institute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We do um, have volunteering opportunities. And, um, you know, um, Jay mentioned about Stacy. Stacy actually is probably looking for some, you know, part-time scrum masters as well. Maybe he will have some volunteering opportunities as well uh, with his group, with his company. Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd love that. I'm re I've am actually been looking a lot over the um, past couple of weeks for a volunteering opportunity. Yep, and happy to connect with me as well. I think Ron put his uh, email. You can connect with me as well in LinkedIn. Just send me um, an email. Yes, it actually only puts your, your first name on Zoom. But um, if I had your full name or the link to your uh, LinkedIn, I would love to connect with you. Andrew, I'll just add that uh, nothing, nothing beats talking to people that are actually doing it and have had a lot of war stories. Um, I know I've spent a lot of time with a number of people on this call and uh, you know, we all have gone through a lot of really horrible things and a lot of really good things too. So, um, you know, happy to uh, throw my hat in the ring too and tell a couple of stories. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I can try and connect with you on LinkedIn. I, I'm going through the um, getting my PSM through the job hackers. And um, I've been reading the scrum guide, some other reading we've been assigned and it, it seems so clear and simple when I read about how it works, but I can imagine how it would get a lot stickier in reality. It, it is a lot simpler if we didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a part that talks about scrum masters having to make sure that no stakeholders or people outside the scrum team disrupt the daily scrum. And that certainly sounds like it could be harder than it seems. Yeah, so one of the things uh, which, you know, everyone's heard me preach about a lot is that uh, 
it's really an ecosystem and it's it's about harmonizing all these things these practices and tools and then harmonizing the mindset uh, and the humanity and then harmonizing the organization design because organization design actually creates culture and then the environment your supply chain everything you've you've got to harmonize all that stuff uh, to, to make this real, right? And then you've got to make it real for every individual in the company or every individual you interact with. Well, what's in it for me, right? So these, these are the things we struggle with all the time and, it, and it's fluid and it changes a lot, it's continuous. So it does make our, our life more fun, but at the same time, it can be frustrating. Yeah, it, it certainly seems like it has that potential. Um, yeah, Katie, I just posted my uh, LinkedIn link as you. well. I was sending my messages to Andrew privately. I don't know why, Andrew, I was doing that. It's always better to be on private setting thinking that you're on everyone than to send a message to everyone thinking that you're on private. Oh, true. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. So thank you everyone so much. Um, I'll definitely reach out to all of you on LinkedIn. All right, cool. And then, um, uh, and now uh, you got plenty of people that uh, will pro provide help to you. So uh, any other questions or topics anyone wants to talk to? We got, you know, about seven more minutes. I was, uh, I was actually going to piggyback a little bit off of what Katie said. I'm in a similar situation, a uh, little bit more experience. Uh, so I've had my PSM certification for about a year and uh, about 18 months job experience working as a scrum master um, with some, some good mentorship. Um, recently was laid off, so I'm in the same situation as her where I'm trying to find a position. Um, obviously already having the certification, like I said, but running into that issue of uh, the amount of experience. So um, I don't want to take up a ton of time, but one, I wanted to see, <clears throat> excuse me, if I could uh, connect with all the same people that she's been speaking to, um, that would be awesome. Um, and then two, if anybody has any recommendations for um, just getting in the room or getting on a call with people in terms of uh, job posts that you're not maybe necessarily qualified for, uh, experience wise, but being able to get on that call so you can demonstrate that, you know, you have the drive and the passion and still viable experience that can be used. Yeah, Jerome, have you found um, uh, any agile uh, groups, any agile meetups in the, uh, it looks like you're in the Phoenix area. Have you found any there? Yeah, so I'm connected with a few people here. Um, just, uh, just really starting to dive into it. This is one of the first meetups that I've attended. Um, so that's definitely something that I'm looking into um, and, and going to continue to do going forward for sure. Yeah, so you're in Phoenix, right? Yes, yes I am. Yeah, so here's a name. I'm typing it in here and then just tell him that Jay Johnson asked you to talk to him about, you know, life in general. <laughs> so, so Jeremy, talk to Jeremy. So he's in, he's in our office in Phoenix and uh, he's an agile coach and he, he has a pretty strong relationship with the Phoenix agile community and mm -hmm. know what's going on and everything. I, I would suggest you hook up with him. Okay. Yeah, I actually, um, the, the gentleman that mentored me for the first eight months uh, being a scrum master actually works for Matrix uh, Resources now too. Um, his name's Todd Sussman. I don't know. If Todd. You know. Yeah, no, Todd. He's great. Yeah. So, all right. I'll definitely reach out to Jeremy. Thank cool. you. You're welcome. Any other things you want to talk about? You got f four minutes. Time boxing. That's all I have. I wanted to thank everyone for being so helpful and letting me steal the topic of the meeting for a couple minutes. I really appreciate it. No That's what we're here for. No problem. Uh, you got to get the young people to replace us old farts. That's for sure. <laughs> hey, talk about uh, yourself, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh...
All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close it uh, and thank everyone again for joining. Uh, we're going to have another one. I don't know what it is yet, but it'll be in June. Uh, we're going to keep doing this uh, for the rest of the year, I think, and see what happens once COVID-19 kind of calms down. We'll, you know, we'll probably have our local sessions, but still have virtual. So keep, keep apprised, everyone, and we'll have another topic soon and get to talk to everyone again. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for hosting, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Bye.